Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to look at the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization method that we can use to compute the QR decomposition of a matrix. The Gram-Schmidt method works by considering successive columns of our matrix and building a sequence of orthonormal vectors that span the same space as those columns. In addition to computing the QR decomposition, the Gram-Schmidt process gives us insight into the matrix structure. Let's now look at computing the QR factorization of our matrix A of size m by n, where m is greater than or equal to n. And one way to picture the QR factorization is to construct a sequence of orthonormal vectors q1, q2, and so on, so that the span of any set q1 to qj is the same as the span of the first j columns of our matrix A. And therefore, we could seek coefficients rij so that the first column of A is equal to some linear combination of q1, the second column of A is equal to some linear combination of q1 and q2, and the nth column of A is some linear combination of q1 up to qn. And we can think of this geometrically in the following small diagram. Suppose that we're just given two vectors, a1 and a2, coming from the two columns of our matrix. Then we could position q1 to align with a1, and we could position q2 to span the same space as what we would get when we add a2, but we could select it so that it is orthogonal to the existing q1. This can be done using the Gram-Schmidt process, and we'll look at the details of this shortly. And if we look at the equations that we have here, linking the vectors a to q, then we can rewrite this in terms of a matrix form, where we say that our matrix a, viewed as columns from 1 to n, can be written in terms of our vectors q from 1 to n multiplied by an upper triangular matrix with entries rij. Now this gives us that our matrix A can be written as q hat multiplied by r hat, where now q hat is an m by n matrix and r hat is an n by n matrix. And this is referred to as the reduced QR factorization, which is slightly different from the definition that we gave previously. We can note that for m greater than n, then we'll have that q hat transpose times q hat is equal to the identity, but we don't necessarily have that q hat times q hat transpose is equal to the identity. And this latter condition is sometimes the reason why the full QR factorization is nice. So the full QR factorization is where A is equal to Q times R. And to get this, we could pad our matrix Q hat with M minus N arbitrary columns that are orthonormal to the ones that we already have. And we also then need to add rows to r hat to silence the effect of those columns when we perform the matrix multiplication. And we therefore obtain that our factor r here is made from our upper triangular matrix r hat padded with the additional m minus n rows of zeros. This gives us two ways to think about the QR factorization. In the full QR approach, we think of our matrix A as being the product of a square matrix Q multiplied against our matrix R that consists of the upper triangular block R hat padded with additional rows of zeros that are indicated in white in this diagram. If we perform this multiplication, the final M minus N columns of Q will multiply against those rows of zeros in R and they will have no effect on the outcome of the multiplication. The second approach, the reduced QR factorization, expresses our matrix A in terms of the product of Q hat, which is a size m by n, 
uh, that matches the size of our matrix A, and that is multiplied against our square matrix R hat of size n by n. And we'll now take a look at how to compute both the full QR factorization and the reduced QR factorization using Python. We'll now look at Python's routines for calculating the QR factorization. And we'll make use of the NumPy library. And we'll first create a random matrix with five rows and three columns. And we'll then perform the QR factorization using the numpy.linalg.qr function. And if we do that, and we look at the factors Q and R, we see that we're actually getting here the reduced QR factorization. So we've got a rectangular Q here and a upper triangular R. If we want to get the full QR factorization, then we can pass in a additional argument to the QR routine called mode equal complete. And if we now look at our factor Q, then we see that we have a full five by five square orthogonal matrix and our factor R is now padded with those additional two rows of zeros. And if we compare our full Q to our reduced Q, then we see that we have two additional columns that have been padded to this, but the first three columns are actually identical. And again, if we compare the R's, then we see that the R's are identical other than the two rows of padded zeros. In the previous video, we looked at how the QR factorization was useful for solving linear least squares problems. And we showed an explicit way that from the QR factorization, we could derive the linear least square solution. We'll now look at this in a different way, using the reduced QR factorization. And we can show that if our matrix A can be written as Q hat R hat, then the solution to a linear least squares problem, AX equal B, can be expressed in terms of R hat of X is equal to Q hat transpose times B. And we'll now look at verifying this result. Let's now look at the connection between the normal equations and the QR factorization. So suppose that we have an overdetermined system, AX equal B, where X is a vector of length N, and b is a vector of length m, where m is greater than or equal to n. And we know that the linear least square solution to this overdetermined system will be given by the normal equations that we can write down as a transpose a, x is equal to a transpose b. And suppose now that we look at our reduced QR factorization. So we write that A is equal to Q hat R hat. And if we substitute this in to this expression, then we'll get Q hat R hat transpose Q hat R hat X is equal to Q hat R hat transpose B. And we can now use a matrix identity to write this part as R hat transpose q hat transpose q hat r hat x is equal to r hat transpose q hat transpose b. And there's now two things that we can do. So the first thing we can note is that our matrix Q has orthonormal columns and therefore this factor of q hat transpose q will just be equal to the identity. And we can also note here that assuming that our matrix A has full rank, then we can say that our R hat matrix will be non-singular, and therefore we can multiply both sides of the equation by R hat transpose inverse, and that will remove these, these two terms. And we'll therefore be left with that R hat of x is equal to Q hat transpose of B. And we can now solve that system to find our linear least squares solution. We can also note that there's a connection to the full QR factorization that we looked at before. So for the full QR factorization, 
we found that we could solve linearly squares problems in terms of the system r hat of x is equal to c1 and in this case c1 was defined by looking at q transpose b and breaking that out into two parts c1 and c2 and in this case here c1 was the first n components and c2 was the remaining m minus n components and we can therefore see that we will have that c1 will actually just be equal to q hat transpose b and therefore we have two agreement between the reduced QR perspective and the full QR perspective. Returning to the Gram-Schmidt process, we can now look at calculating the vectors QI for i equal 1 to n. And if we look at the jth step, we'll need to find a vector QJ that's contained within the span of the first j columns of A, but that QJ should also be orthogonal to the span of the vectors q1 up to qj minus 1. And we can do this via direct construction. First, we write down a vector vj that's equal to the jth column of A with a number of terms subtracted. We subtract off q1 transpose times the first column of A times q1. And we continue with this up to qj minus 1 transpose times the j minus 1th column of A times qj minus 1. And if we look at the effect of each of these terms that we subtract, they will orthogonalize the vector formed by the jth column of A with respect to one of the previous q vectors. And you can verify that if you take a dot product of this vector vj with respect to any one of the previous q vectors, then you will get zero, meaning that we have orthogonality. So to find our qj, we can just normalize this vector vj. We can now determine the required values of rij. And we can rewrite our set of equations in a form where we can explicitly express our q vectors in terms of our columns of our matrix A. And from this, we can read off what our values of R should be. We find here that Rij would just be equal to the dot product of qi and the jth column of A. And that's for i not equal to j. And if we look at a term rjj, then in magnitude, that should be equal to the Euclidean norm of the jth column of A minus the sum from i equal 1 to j minus 1 of rij times qi. One thing we can note here is that the sign of rjj is not determined uniquely but we could choose that each of the rjj was greater than zero for each j. This leads us to the classical Gram-Schmidt process, and we can write this out in an algorithm as shown below. The outer loop would be over j from 1 to n, and we'd set our vj equal to the jth column of our matrix A, and we would then perform this orthogonalization with respect to all of the previous q vectors. So we'd compute our factor rij in terms of that dot product of q with the jth column, and we would then subtract off the component um, that we get from that previous q vector. We would then normalize the resulting vector. Now, this is referred to as the classical Gram-Schmidt method. And the only way that this process can fail is if we find that Rjj has zero magnitude, which would mean that our vector Vj would have zero Euclidean norm. And this can only happen if we have 
that our jth column of A is equal to the sum from i equal 1 to j minus 1 of Rij times Qi for some j. And that is a statement that tells us that the jth column of A is contained within the span of the vectors Q1 up to Qj minus 1. And that is equal to the span of the vectors from the first column of A up to the j minus 1th column of A. And this essentially states that A has columns that are linearly dependent. So if Gram-Schmidt fails, then that tells us that the columns of A are linearly dependent. Equivalently, we have the contrapositive result that tells us that if the columns of A are linearly independent, then the Gram-Schmidt process will succeed. And there's a theorem that states that every rectangular matrix, m by n matrix, with m greater than or equal to n, of full rank, has a unique reduced QR factorization, A is equal to Q hat times R hat, where all of those terms RII are greater than zero. And so the only non-uniqueness then comes from the sign of those terms RII, and hence if we enforce that all of the RII are greater than zero, we will get a unique solution. From here, we can state a, another result, and now we can see that every matrix A regardless of whether it has linearly dependent columns or not, has a full QR factorization. So the first case is that A is a full rank. And in this case, we can just compute our reduced QR factorization as above. And we can then make our full Q matrix square by padding our Q hat matrix with another M minus N arbitrary orthonormal columns, and we then pad our factor r hat by m minus n rows of zeros. So case two would be that A doesn't have full rank. And in this case, when we're computing the reduced QR factorization, we'll encounter a case where the Euclidean norm of Vj evaluates to zero. And at this point, we can just pick an arbitrary orthogonal vector Qj that is orthogonal to the span from Q1 up to Qj minus 1, and then we can proceed as in case 1. So the classical Gram-Schmidt algorithm turns out to be numerically unstable, and it turns out to be sensitive to rounding error when we do these various projections of our columns of A with respect to the previous vectors Q I. And we can actually reformulate the algorithm into the modified Gram-Schmidt process, which is numerically more robust. And the key idea here is that whenever we compute a new vector qj, we immediately orthogonalize the remaining columns of A with respect to that new q vector. So this can be written out as an algorithm. So now we have a loop for i equal 1 to n, and we just set all of the vi equal to the corresponding columns of our matrix A. And we now do a loop from i equal 1 to n, and we first compute the size of our vector v, and we use that to compute a normalized vector q, and here, because we're assuming that all of the columns have already been orthogonalized, when we compute that vector q, we know that it should already satisfy our orthogonality properties. Once we have that new vector q, we now have to orthogonalize all of the remaining columns with respect to it. So we have a loop now for j equal i plus 1 to n, and we then orthogonalize each of the remaining vj. There's a key difference between the modified Gram-Schmidt approach and the classical Gram-Schmidt approach. In the classical Gram-Schmidt approach, when we compute the orthogonalization coefficients, the rij, we do so with respect to the raw original vector given by the jth column of A. In the modified Gram-Schmidt approach, when we compute a orthogonalization coefficient rij, 
we first take our jth column of A and we remove the components of that vector with respect to the previous Q vectors from 1 to I minus 1. So this makes no difference mathematically and if we worked in exact arithmetic they would give exactly the same result. But in practice, when we're using finite precision arithmetic, we find that the modified approach reduces the degradation of orthogonality of the Q vectors. And this results in superior numerical stability for modified Gram-Schmidt. If we look at an operation count, the work in the modified Gram-Schmidt algorithm is dominated by lines 8 and 9 in the innermost loop. And there we have that we compute an orthogonalization coefficient Rij in terms of a scalar product between a Q vector and a V vector. And we then subtract a multiple of the Q vector from the V vector. And the first line here will involve m multiplications and m minus 1 additions. And the second line will involve m multiplications and m subtractions. So the work required will be asymptotic to 4m operations per single inner iteration. So the total number of operations will be asymptotic to the sum from i equal 1 to n of the sum from j equal i plus 1 to n of 4m. And that works out to be asymptotic to 2 times m times n squared. If we look at a square matrix where m is equal to n, then we see that the work required to do the QR factorization is asymptotic to 2n cubed, which is three times as large as the work to do the LU factorization. And this is one reason why the LU factorization is preferred for solving linear systems.